All right, so we're going to talk about colon cancer now and how it develops. So we're going to start with colonic polyps, which is the beginnings. The colonic polyp is a raised protrusion of soft tissue in the colon. Okay, and this can may or may not be neoplastic, this protrusion of soft tissue. When I say neoplastic, I mean does it have potential to become malignant, a.k.a. to spread out and to metastasize to other parts of the body. Now there's two types, there's many different types of colonic polyps that we should we can classify based on histology. The two most important ones to know are hyperplastic and adenomatous colonic polyps. Hyperplastic polyps are non-neoplastic. They arise from hyperplasia, hence the name, of the glands. So the glands grow too much and you, you get a little polyp or a protrusion of soft tissue. This is most commonly seen in the sigmoid colon. Next we have adenomatous polyps, aka an adenoma. These are neoplastic proliferations of glands. That is, they do have malignant potential. And they have, they have this potential to become malignant through this process of the adenoma carcinoma sequence where they transform from their benign nature of adenoma into an adenocarcinoma, which is malignant. Now, these are usually seen in patients after 50 years of age and they take 10 years for the malignant transformation to occur. And this is why we start screening patients at age 50 and we do it every 10 years because it takes 10 years for this transformation to occur, so that's why it's the optimal time, um, interval time, interval to do screening. Now we can divide our adenomatous polyps into uh, histologically into villus and tubular types, and the other key thing to note is that villus have a higher malignant potential, and it's easy to remember because villus is a villain. So villus adenomatous polyps have a higher malignant, higher potential to become malignant than the tubular, tubular adenomatous polyps. So now we talked about the adenoma carcinoma sequence, so let's go dig deep into that. And this sequence describes how a normal colonic mucosal cell can transform into a carcinoma through a series of gene mutations. So you start with the normal colon, okay? Normal colon here, this is the mucosa. This is then the submucosa, etc. So I said, there's, there's going to get a series of gene mutations. The very first gene mutation we're going to get is APC. This inactivation of the APC, it's a tumor suppressor gene. If you lose that, you're going to get uncontrolled cellular proliferation. And so this normal mucosa will become a small polyp. Okay, It's a small polyp with a hyperproliferative epithelium. Now the next gene mutation that must occur in this carcinoma sequence is a mutation in the KRAS oncogene. It's an activation in this oncogene, so you're going to get unregulated cell growth. If you get unregulated cell growth, this small polyp will increase in size, and you're going to get an adenoma. Finally, if you finally have another gene mutation, due to loss of tumor suppressor genes P53 and DCC, you're going to get a malignant transformation, and it's, become a, it's going to become a carcinoma. So the mnemonic to remember this sequence is AK53. You start with APC, that's how you get to become a small polyp. Then the KRAS activation turns your small polyp into an adenoma. And then you, you lose the tumor suppressors of P53 and DCC. That's how you get cancer. So remember, there's like a lot of guardians. You have to have many different steps here to occur. And then remember, these take place over the, around a 10-year period where a polyp will become a carcinoma. So that is the sequence. Now we're going to talk about hereditary syndromes that predispose to colorectal cancer. Note that all the syndromes we're going to discuss are auto autosomal dominant inheritance, okay? So that's easy to remember at least. The first one is a familial adenomatous polyposis. This is a mutation in the ABC tumor suppressor gene, which we just saw in the adenoma carcinoma sequence. Now there's a two-hit hypothesis for this. and The two-hit hypothesis states that one of this mutated APC alleles is inherited and the, the second hit will cause a mutation of the second allele the second APC allele and that's needed for the development of colorectal cancer after that second hit they're going to lose that um, they're basically going to get lose the tumor suppressor, get hyperproliferation you're going to get developed thousands of adenomatous polyps as you can see here there's just, the colon is just covered in polyps all over. And 
you have to remove the colon and the rectum for these patients, or the patient will, delete, will develop colorectal cancer. You have to remove it, okay? Now, the next one is Gardner syndrome. This is a variant of the FAP syndrome because it's basically FAP, the same thing as FAP, and you get bone and soft tissue tumors. The way I remember this is I think of a rock garden with soft dirt. So the rocks stand for the bone, garden is for gardener, and soft dirt is for soft tissue. So rock garden with soft dirt for the Gardner syndrome. Charcot is another variant. It's the FAP or Lynn syndrome, and you get brain tumors. So easy Turcot syndrome with the turban because of the brain tumors. Okay, now we're going to go into some some syndromes with hamartomas. So the first one is, I don't even know how to say this, putz jaggers syndrome. It has hamartomas, which are benign polyps throughout the GI tract, and they have hyperpigmented spots in the mouth, on, on the mouth, hands, or genitalia, okay? These are hyperpigmented spots seen in putz jaggers syndrome. This one has an increased risk of all GI cancers. When I say all, I mean colorectal cancer, stomach cancer, pancreatic cancer, small intestinal cancer, all are increased risk in the syndrome, and there's risk, increased risk of breast cancer, okay? So it's increased risk of GI cancers as well as these hyperpigmented spots. The other syndrome with hamartomas is juvenile polyposis syndrome. So all you have to know about it is you look at the name juvenile, then you see it's, you basically know it's seen in children less than five years old. And they have all these hematomatous polyps and they have increased risk of colorectal cancer. So these are the polyposis syndromes. I'm going to talk about one more syndrome on the same page. This is not a polyposis syndrome. This is Lynch syndrome, um, aka HNPCC syndrome, uh, which actually stands for hereditary non polyposis. Hereditary non polyposis. I don't even remember what the last two words. Let's see. Ignore me, just, just look it up if you really want to know. But basically, this is a mutation in DNA mismatch repair genes. Okay? Usually when you replicate your DNA, there's some, there's some mismatch errors, and there's genes that help you repair that. If your mutation doesn't work, you get microsatellite instability, which basically is a predispos predisposition to mutations, because you get these mutations that you can't fix. Okay? This is not a polyposis syndrome like the above ones, because it only, you only see a few polyps in the colon. But there is increased risk of colorectal cancer and female-specific cancer. When I say female-specific, I mean ovarian and endometrial. Okay? You want to remember these two. Lynch syndrome, Lynch syndrome has increased risk of colorectal cancer and ovarian and endometrial cancers. The way I remember is Lynch syndrome. I call it Lynch syndrome. Lynch is like a female name to get female-specific cancers. Now we've talked about syndromes, let's talk about actual colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer is a cancer arising in the colon or the rectum. It's the third most common cancer for everybody. It's the third most common cause of death. So this is a pretty significant cancer. Most of our patients are older than 50 years old. Okay, let's talk about risk factors now. I already mentioned some risk factors. What were the risk factors I mentioned? I mentioned having those adenomatous polyps that you're at risk. What type of adenomatous polyps was worse? Tubular villus, where the villus was worse. Okay, what else? Having that familial cancer syndrome. Okay, FAP, Turcotte, Gardner, Putz, uh, Yotes, Jeggers, uh, having uh, juvenile polyposis, Lynch syndrome, all these are risks. What other disease is a risk factor for this? Remember that I said inflammatory bowel disease is a risk factor for this. Okay, so those are all risk factors. And additional ones include tobacco use, consumption of red or processed meats, and smoked foods, and a low fiber diet. These are all risk factors for colorectal cancer. Now screening, I just mentioned screening. What was it again? Try to recall that. What you do is you start at age 50 for the general population. You give them colonoscopy every 10 years. Again, remember we see polyps starting at age 50. It takes 10 years to transform into a malignant carcinoma. You, get, you have a couple other options for screening with different time intervals. So you can give them uh, fecal occult blood testing. You're testing for blood in the stool because if you have blood in the stool, you, it's from bleeding and bleeding is often um, from the cancer. Cancer with all the blood vessels. I told you about that. You can also use a flex um, sigmoidoscopy. So you're just looking at the sigmoid as you can see here in this orange. Flex, flexible sigmoidoscopy only goes this far. It looks at the sigmoid colon while colonoscopy looks all the way through the whole colon. So the way this presents is, 
if you look at the ascending colon, it presents as an exophytic mass, so the protruding mass, and this mass bleeds. Okay, if you're getting bleeding, then you're gonna get iron deficiency anemia. The way I remember this is the right side is red. Right side is red. I do want to note that usually this bleed is occult, so you're not gonna see bright blood in the poop. Is that you're not gonna be able to see it, but that's why you do a fecal occult test. You can see blood because exophytic mass on the right side, right side is red. Descending colon is a little different. Tumors here infiltrate and encircle the wall of the colon. So they infiltrate it, okay? They are circling the wall and they narrow the lumen and they cause obstruction, okay? If you get obstruction of the lumen of your colon, you're gonna get constipation and abdominal distension because poop can't leave. And the way I remember this is the left side has less lumen. Right side is red because it bleeds, it's exophytic and it bleeds. Left side infiltrates and has less lumen and obstruction. So I said the diagnosis, you go in the colon and if you see anything that looks like cancer, you biopsy it. If your colonoscopy is incomplete, you can try a barium enema. What you're going to see on a barium enema is an apocor lesion due to narrowing of the lumen. I've shown it here, the barium is, is this white looking stuff that you can see. It's, it looks nice on the x-rays and you can see that there's narrowing of the lumen so it looks like an apple core like it just ate around the whole apple and that is very suspicious for colorectal cancer finally we have serum tumor markers like CA, CEA we can use it to assess treatment or respond or detect disease recurrence um, however we do not use this for screening why do we not use this for screening because this can also be elevated with other tumors and benign diseases. So if you have an increased CAA, it doesn't necessarily mean you have colorectal cancer. It might be because you have a tumor in the pancreas. That can increase your CAA. So you can't, you can't screen for colorectal cancer with this. But if you do know you have colorectal cancer, you can follow the levels of CAA. See if, you're, see if the cancer is decreasing. See if it's, if you, maybe if you completely re um, remove the cancer, see if it's recurred. So yeah, so that's it for colorectal cancer and all the polyps and all the familial syndromes and the adenomal carcinoma se sequences. All of this stuff is very high yield stuff, so make sure you know all of it that I've talked about.